In this episode, Ryan and I discuss what Nelson Nash writes on page 38 of Becoming Your Own Banker, specifically whether you should use a limited pay or a traditional whole life policy to practice the infinite banking concept. And I can't think of a better way to spend Christmas. Thank you for listening and Merry Christmas. Welcome to the Bank with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery. I'm your co-host, Ryan Griggs. And here we're going to do a Christmas episode today because we love you. We love Christmas and gift giving and receiving and mainly giving. Um, but it's been a minute. You know, it seems like it's been a minute. The holidays are brutal. And <laughs> Thanksgiving, you know, Travis tries to spend good time with family and then... Here we are now, Christmas, and you got the lights off. It's all disorienting. So this is a tough time. <laughs> Ryan doesn't like the lights off. It's an intimate setting. This looks really nice. Y'all did well. Does. I imagine that would be Julie or Jana. And probably Jess. You. And Jess, Jess. Okay. What do you mean, probably now? Why are you taking me out of the equation? <laughs> so, oh, and, I'm trying uh, to be accurate. I'm sure Justin and Jess mainly did it. Yeah, yeah, somebody had something to do with it, and they did a good job. They did. Not only did they do that, but we had the we have a book room. You know, we sell a lot of a lot of books. Yeah, you're really excited about this. I no, I really am. You know, we moved into this building like in 2017, and it was all remodeled. It was an old county courthouse. We moved over here for this big room, which it was a it was a sub courthouse, the county in which I live, and so they had the uh, Justice of the Peace court here and this was a courtroom so it was, it was big and so that's why we moved over here so we could do events and uh and did it you know nelson spoke here paul cleveland spoke here uh, but then it quickly turned into a podcast room my point here is that room there were there was some shelving in there at the time the contractors pulled it out and then they wandered off and never to return and so we may do, but those shelves were replaced because they were kind of custom made for the square footage in there. And that was done. And it's a beautiful thing. You I, wish, you, I wish you could see it. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to get a furniture update. I like the uh, evolution of the activities in this room. We went from consuming wealth with the government services that were occurring here to live in-person events. You know, so good private activity, but restricted to just individual people. And now there's a whole digital show in here. Look at this. Look at this beautiful evolution of it the was, space. Listen, there's a whole story. <laughs> uh, a lot of my clients know uh, how this whole building came into. <clears throat> I should spend time on it later. Okay. But yeah. it went from a. You financed the purchase of it. I did. And then, too, you know, it's a, it county property. So there's a bidding thing. They have their whole. Uh, method on how to buy and sell property or do whatever the everything that they do you know it takes all the people on a in a in a court to do all that and uh a couple of them were reluctant you know i said listen you've got a building there that you're paying to maintain and it was empty they tried to sell it to the city the city didn't want it uh because of all the capital and that it would take you know to to remodel or whatever and then I'm, I'm, I just made the case. I made a fair offer to, and I'm, I'm going to continue since it's up. Okay. Um, I was explaining to these individuals, and one has become a great friend and client. Okay. I'm like, that building is costing you money. It is a liability. As soon as I buy it, I've got to pay taxes on it. And therefore, it becomes a cash flowing asset, not a liability. Got to explain that to the tax collector, huh? I did. And one of them got it. No, they were the, the not the tax collector. I mean, I don't think that you can explain anything to them no. about theft or private property. Um, but then, because I was able to finance it, you know, they, I made an offer. They made a counter offer. And my counter to their counter was, yes, if you can close within 10 days. And they're like, what? So that's yeah. what happened. That's ha part of having the, the liquidity, being able to pay cash, got you the building. I basically. think I think some of my negotiation skills helped too. Okay, well, give a little credit there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Cash is king. I don't care what you say, what you hear. Yeah. Cash value is really king. Okay, I'm in fifth year of this podcast. We're in the fifth year of this podcast. So fifth Christmas. 
for banking with life. That's kind of cool. Um, and I got to say thank you to some of the uh, people on the Facebook group that I'm not going to name, but that was started, that people know about, that was started uh, in response to this podcast because the two uh, founders there of that Facebook group uh, had an unpleasant experience, I guess. They didn't meet the uh, client qualifications. They yep. tried to become our client, tried to become your client. Full disclosure. Have a diff- they have a different philosophy on how to do uh, <laughs> policy design. Uh, so they started their little group, but apparently things have changed over time, and now uh, my name gets your name gets thrown around, and people say nice things, and they point to the podcast and to the mechanic series. So uh, thank you to that group and to those people. And yeah, uh, thanks for releasing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we were talking before we got started here, fleshing out all of our very thorough and uh, intricate ideas for what to talk about today. <laughs> I'm like, Ryan, what would you listen to on the way down here? And music, so I could think, well, okay, what you think about? And, um, but I had, a good, I had a good week. We had good, good conversations with clients. I was grateful to one client in particular. I've got Nelson's book open here, Becoming Your Own Banker, right? The book. Uh, to page thirty-eight and thirty-nine, and I had a call with the had a couple calls with one particular client this week who asked a really great question, and so I will try to convey that, and then you can tell me what you think. So we're over on page thirty-eight, and one of the things that I've talked about a lot, that we've talked about a lot, that sort of gets a lot of coverage on this podcast, and that is kind of different from the rest of what's out there. Uh, is an attitude towards policy design. And one element of that attitude is purchasing a policy that we might call a traditional whole life contract, or, tri- uh, a, or you might say a long pay policy. Policy, right? When we refer to whole life policies, you might talk about contracts that are paid up, meaning where the initial death benefit is finally fully paid for. You might talk about that year in terms of the age of the insured when that final year happens, right? So a paid up at 100 policy or a whole life policy paid up at age 100 is one where base premium is going to be payable from the year the policy goes in force until the policy year in which the insured reaches age 100. So you refer to that setup as whole life paid up at age 100 or whole life paid to 100 or something to that effect. And then the other side, you have relatively more shorter pay contracts, shorter pay policies, we call them. These are 10 or 20 pay, even a single pay and this kind of language the single the 10 the 20 that refers to the number of policy years over which one would pay uh, base premium and so you can see that those are shorter right 10 or 20 years of base premium payment is likely less premium payment than if we have a traditional pay to age 100 or even 121 so those are the contrast right single pay long pay all right and my attitude is that premium is a good thing uh, I want to pay it for a long time. It's essentially a contribution to capital, contributes to this ongoing compounding growth effect inside of this cash value curve that I can't get anywhere else. So I want to do it for a long time, right? The banking function doesn't go away. In fact, it, the need to own and control it only gets more uh, important over time as my needs for capital increase. What? Yeah. So premium's a good thing. I want to pay it for a long time. And so I like a uh, traditional longer pay type policies. And this client that I was talking to, shout out to Nicola, Nicola watches, asked a very good question. And others have sort of brought it up before. He's like, okay, well, I get, you know, I get that, that we want to premium is a good thing. want to pay it for a long time. But I opened Nelson's book to page 38 and I read on the left hand side, about halfway down that returning to the scale of policies above, meaning re- referring to the graphic he's got on that page, Uh, returning to the graphic above, suppose that the insured was 25 years old, then the ordinary life policy would be a 75 pay plan, meaning a whole life policy paid to age 75. The payment plan could be shortened by buying a life paid up at age 65 for the same 25 year old. This would be a 40 pay plan. It could be further shortened to a 30 pay or a 20 pay. And then here's the line. The shorter the payment period, the better suited it is for the purposes of the infinite banking concept. Well, let's just stop reading right there and close the book. (laughs) Well, you can see how that might give somebody the impression that looks pretty plain to me. The shorter the payment period, the better suited it is for the. So what are you talking about? Shouldn't I be getting 
I've been have I been doing this wrong for six right. years? Right, that's or? even italicized. That that sentence is, yeah. is for effect. Mm-hmm. Right, I get it. <clears throat> Should I continue, or what do you think? Uh, I've got a lot. You know, I've spoke about this on page thirty eight many times. I think it's very important. Um, and I mean, there's a whole lot there. But and yes, I've read that. Nelson, I know personally owned ten pay policies. Right. Okay. The next column, right underneath the, the graphic, when using this type of life insurance to solve your, bank, your need for banking, it is best to select a plan, the base policy that is in the middle of the scale, such as ordinary life. Um, or life paid up at age 65 and add a PUA rider to the plan. Now, listen, I mean, there's a, this isn't, this is a big deal to me. Uh, it's important. You know, I know in the big wide world, especially in the infinite banking world, you know, you get lost in the weeds talking about structure. Uh, okay. Structure is important. You know, if you're going to build something, the structure should be important. The foundation should be firm so you can build whatever you want to on top of that. So I don't want to get lost in the weeds, but I'm telling you and encouraging you to consider the importance of structure. Okay. So Nelson tells you right there, it is best if we're going to practice banking to use a plan, the whole life plan in the middle of the scale, such as ordinary life at that time would be paid to age 100. All life insurance, this book was printed in 2000. Life insurance was written and designed to age 100, the theoretical life expectancy of 100 years. Or, so he says use a paid to 100 or a paid to age 65 in the middle of the scale. All right. Well, now if it's paid to age 65, you know, and how old are you when you start? You know, so uh, my point here is, he says, the best policy for banking for the base plan is in the middle of the scale, such as page 100, page age 65. So now we want to talk about duration. Then how old are you? Right? That's what my comment on that is. Okay. And the importance of that. And then I can continue, but you go first, sir. Yeah. So for... uh just to sort of back up here for people who don't have the book in front of them, you know, page 38, fifth edition of the book. So when you get a down moment, go glance at this. But we talk about this graphic, and maybe the guys can put up an image at this yeah, time. But, um, so we're, we're, he's talking about modified endowment contracts, and there's this depiction of different types of policies. On the far left, you have a single premium policy, and then as you proceed to the right, there's a 20 pay, and then a life paid up at 65, and then the ordinary life, and then all the way further furthest to the right, he has term insurance. So there's this spectrum of different base policies, different just ordinary whole, well, just base policies, right? Base premium and initial death benefit. Which is another important point. Yeah. Uh, There's no term anywhere in this book. Term writer. No term writer. These policies, Nelson didn't illustrate anywhere in his book the use of a term writer, and there are reasons for that. Yeah. All right, so when you say base, you're, you're talking about base, typical, traditional, whole life. Yeah. Base premium and death benefit associated with it. That's what's depicted on this scale. And then on the left-hand side where we have that line in italics, which I've read previously, the shorter the payment period, the better suited it is for the purposes of the infinite banking concept. This gets to the idea that a relatively limited pay contract for a fixed amount of initial death benefit will generate or show higher cash value growth than will a longer pay ordinary base whole life policy for the same fixed death benefit. Okay, there's a lot of layers to that right there, right? And it it, it kind of has to do with understanding the nature of value growth and what base premium is in relationship to this initial death benefit, right? When you go to get whole life insurance, the, the foundation, the starting point for all whole life is what we call the base policy. There's some fixed 
initial death benefit. Some people will say face amount, right? It's some amount of fixed death benefit payable upon the death of the insured whenever that happens, right? And that's from day one right away for the life of the contract, so long as premium is paid, that initial death benefit remains fixed. I call it initial death benefit, right? Some say initial face amount, whatever. It's initial death benefit and base premium. Those two elements together, that is the base policy. It's the starting point for the contract, right? And we pay base premium over several years, typically, and until we say that the policy is paid up. And that that's informal sort of shortcut, shorthand type language. What what really we mean is that you're gonna reach a year in the future where you've you'll you'll pay your final year's worth of base premium. And in that final year, after that final base premium payment, the initial death benefit, that fixed amount of death benefit that's been in force ever since the policy was started, that fixed initial death benefit will eventually become fully paid up. You'll have paid everything you owe for it, all right, at some point in the future. And that, at that point in the future, we say the policy is paid up. Okay. The example I use in the book that I'm doing, How to Buy Whole Life, uh, has to do with Costco, right? If I go to Costco on July 1 and I pay $1,000 for a TV and I give them all the $1,000, mm -hmm. they give me the TV, I go home. We might suppose, you know, I go to return the TV the next day, right? I'm going to get a refund. How much is Costco going to give me? Right? Well, they're going to give me $1,000. They're going to give me what I paid for it. Right? I paid them $1,000 the day prior, I take the refund, they're going to give me the full grand. All right. In contrast, if I bought the TV on installments, so maybe Costco is going to let me pay $250 per month for four months. So on July 1, I go pay my 250, I take the TV home. July 2, I don't like it, I'm gonna go take it back, I want a refund, how much money are they gonna give me? What's the TV worth to them? Is it $1,000? Well, of course not, I didn't pay the thousand, I only paid 250, right? I'm on the installment plan. So they're only gonna give me back, let's say, the $250. Right? In other words, I, I've elected to take longer to pay for the thing and by doing so, by choosing to pay in installments of 250 per month, I've gen I'm generating value slower mm -hmm. in, the, in the property, the TV, than I would have generated it if I had paid for it all up front. All right, if I hadn't taken so long to pay for it, if I had just paid $1,000 day one instead of 250 for, per month for four months, I'd have generated $1,000 of value in the TV, and Costco would give me a refund for that amount. Right? That, and the, the underlying point is that the longer I take to pay for something, the slower I generate value in it, right? The shorter I take to pay for something, the quicker I generate value in it. In life insurance, that something is the initial death benefit, right? I'm paying base premium for an initial death benefit. And if I pay for that initial death benefit quicker in fewer years, a more limited pay, a shorter pay type policy, a 10 pay, a 20 pay, then I'm gonna generate cash value in that policy faster than if I had taken longer to pay for it. Right, then I had done like a pay to 100 or a pay to 95. Right, and this is a, maybe this is a complex idea and it sounds like sometimes I feel like a drone on when I explain this, but like that's the, that's the underlying nature of value generation in whole life. And it has to do with how long we're gonna pay for whatever, for the fixed death benefit. I know we, if we notice though, in that whole setup, like I'm assuming a, again, a fixed death benefit in both cases, Right, the limited pay and the longer pay. Um, and I've, we've not talked about term writers. We've not talked about PUA writers. We've not talked about anything else, just the base policy. Right. Not dividends, just a base right. policy, death benefit, just, duration. Just the base policy, right? And so at this, and that's my point to this guy, although I took longer to explain it here, but that was my point is that so far at that point, we're just talking about a base policy, yes. right? Cash value growth dynamics are more efficient in a shorter pay contract. That's true, but you can't stop there, right? Because the PUA premium- Then he says, add PUA to that policy that right. you select from the middle of the graph. Yeah, so that line you read, comes later, right? When using this type of life insurance to solve your need for banking, it is best to select a plan that is in the middle of the scale. And on the graphic, what's in the middle of the scale is your longer pay policies, right? Such as an ordinary life or a life paid to 65 and add a paid up additions rider, right? And, you know, like P PUA premium is extremely unique, right? The, the, it's, it's very much like a single pay base whole life policy. In that there's one payment, right? One premium payment or one time payment of some amount 
that adds incrementally more death benefit, and that new death benefit is fully paid for. Paid up additions, paid, paid up. And, yeah. and, and to go back one step on, in the graph, there are three uh, policies that Nelson put in the graph. One was a 20 pay. The other was a life paid up at 65, and the other is ordinary pay, which paid to age 100. Notice, even when he said it is best to choose a life paid up at age 65 or ordinary, those are a longer duration than the 20 pay. Yes. Yeah. So when it, yeah, when it's what's best to the life insurance that's best to use for IBC is to the right along that spectrum of duration, right? That a longer pay contract. And then to add a PUA rider. Yes. And so like what's happening, and this is what I want to get across, is like the relationship between PUA premium and the underlying base policy, right? By paying base premium, you're in some sense buying the right to pay PUA premium. And the longer one pays base premium, the longer you have the right to pay PUA premium, right? Typically, Base premium, typically PUA premium is not allowed if there's no base premium allowed, right? Once a policy comes paid up, very often, no other premiums of any kind are payable, including PUA. So by paying base premium, by selecting this long, ordinary pay type underlying base policy, we establish the foundation that we need in order to then pay PUA premium for a very long time. And PUA premium is in some sense even more cash value efficient than is the single premium policy that's shown on the graphic. Yes. Right? Like you could take a pen and continue that horizontal line, that scale on this graph off to the left, off the page, and over on the far left, put a PUA premium. And the reason is that PUA premium, as I was getting to earlier, is more cash value efficient. PUA premium generates more cash value per premium dollar than does a base whole life premium dollar into a single pay contract, right? Like if you took a, just a, ordin a single pay whole life policy, which by the way, would be a mech, you know, maybe you get 65% cash value in the first year. Right, 60 to 70, let's say, right? There's, so 100 grand in, 60 to $70,000 cash value uh, d year one. You do a $100,000 PUA premium, you're gonna have much closer to 100% of that payment in cash value right then. And you'll have a, the difference is a PUA expense charge and those vary company to company, but the magnitude of the PUA expense charge is often much less than the expense allowance that goes into the, uh, oh, wow. essentially the deflation base. of the cash value growth curve. Okay. Right? <clears throat> so that, in other words, my what I'm saying is that you want a blend. Yeah. Right? We want enough base premium for a long time because that buys the ability to pay then the most efficient form, the most cash value efficient form of premium, which is PUA. Right? I think there's a couple of points too. When you take the PUA, if you went to the left off of the page, um, you know, it would be a, a it would be a mech. You can't do that. The PUA yeah. is a rider to a whole life policy. Right. And here, and I'm not trying to be. I just want to make some very clear points. At that time, uh, before Nelson, this before he comes up with the infinite banking concept, he he discovers that you know uh, a mutual company pays dividends, and there are several dividend elections or options, and one of them was a PUA. Right, so the dividend could be paid into the PUA. It's buying paid up additional death benefit, and the majority of it's going to cash. As a matter of fact, most of the time when a dividend is paid to the PUA, there is no expense charge to the dividend. It just goes straight to cash and buys a, a, a paid up death benefit. Okay, it it was later here in in to the late and uh, mid to late nineties, I believe, when the unscheduled. PUA became available, right? Where you could weight a premium to a PUA, all right? You mean and, like in the form of a PUA rider? Yeah, and the yeah, no question, the, the PUA okay. rider period is what is what is going on here. So, a couple of points that I want to make that that yes, the and it, and it goes further. The PUA is a rider, so you're not going to be able to pay a PUA premium without a whole life policy, and if it's paid up. Like you said a minute ago, you're not going to be able to pay a PUA premium. The dividend, the dividend can still be applied there. 
So yeah, you go to the left, it would be more efficient than the short term, the single premium, but you can't do it. It would be a mech anyway. And then you're making the point that the further out, well, no, you're not making the point the further out you go, other than the you want the contractual right to pay a premium a long time, therefore you can pay a PUA. Yeah. Okay. Abs- yes, at hundred percent. Okay. Perfect. I just I think those are important. There's more. But well, and we can build further on that, right? Like, mm-hmm. you, so if we we have this idea that, go ahead. Well, it, it, you were get you got to the point where structure matters. Yeah, the blend you want to blend. Want to blend, right? Yes, and the question just becomes how much of one. There you right? go. But couched in the broader, more fundamental context of we want the ability to pay for a long time. Right. You know, like the stuff online about cash value as early as possible, you know, maximum cash value as early as possible. All that is short-term oriented thinking that where the, the, the root idea is that premium is a bad thing. It's a cost. Absolutely. It's, it's made- a continuation of flawed thinking. Yeah. No question. I mean, and you're in, in, I mean, I have spoken exactly on this. You in the uh, last October 20. 20- 23 banking with life i mean you graphically proved the focus is too short term whenever you yeah. focus on the PUA. and then let me see and you said it earlier as well that every company has different charges and abilities and flexibilities with their pua whenever you see um the like a 1090 i know i hate even talking about it but it's important because you're getting beat up with it in my opinion um that is the limit that that particular company will allow yeah there's no magic to that number other than you know it might illustrate and you do that's the limit of that company or the those two companies yeah and i have never seen the name of the company that will actually let you go even further uh, the name of that company never gets thrown. It around. never gets. They probably around. don't have a contract with that company. They don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, I know. More but than I want to know. I mean, look. Okay. We're, what I'm telling you is that yes, there is a division online. You know, in some sense, it's nice because people used to think that oh, IBC, everybody does the same thing, and I think people are starting to figure out that no, that's just because you use the same letters doesn't mean you do the same thing. And there, there, there is a difference of opinion here, right? There, there is a short term oriented. I say short term oriented because that's what. Well, they want the, the the implicit assumption is that cash value growth should be maximized as early as possible relative to premium, right? So on an annual basis, either you want the annual cash value growth to exceed the annual premium as soon as possible, or you want the total cash value to exceed the cost basis as soon as possible. One or the other, they'll pick one. They won't explain why one or the other type metrics matters, but they'll pick one. And then it's just a matter of them looking at the page and seeing when the numbers are bigger you know, relatively bigger than premium and saying, okay, that's therefore best. Right. But all of that is couched in the broader unspoken assumption that premium is a bad look. The reason we want to accentuate the benefit, the reason we want to accentuate cash value earlier is because that's the thing that's good. The premium that we have to pay to get it is bad. Right. So we want as much of the good relative to the bad thing as possible. And that's just, that's the assumption. Now, you could take the other side of that, which is where I started, which is to say that the banking problem never goes away. The need to pay premium, statistically speaking, only increases because we make more money the older we get. Uh, things are, if you think things are going to worsen economically in terms of things like price inflation, then maybe you want to offset that falling purchasing power out there in the world by increasing purchasing power in your own economy. If you want to do that, then that's more reason to pay more premium, right? There's this other, this whole separate idea that premium payment is a good thing and I want to do it or at least have the right to do it should I be willing and able to pay it for as long as possible. And if you do that, if that's what actually ends up happening, cash values, death benefits, dividends all become much greater than if you went with the short-term oriented route in the first place. And yeah, yeah. And of course, I'm over here squirming, you know, it's like, this is where I live. Um, The basics, the fundamentals, you cannot jump over them or don't let them go unconsidered. As trite as it sounds, as simplistic as it sounds or appears, you hit it right on the nose. Number one, 
think long range. That is a violation. Of course, if you're short term thinking, you're not thinking long term. Okay, that is what it is. Some, you know, it's a matter of duration, right? Yeah. Okay, of thinking. And then number two, don't be afraid to capitalize. The idea that a premium is a bad thing, you want to pay it as soon as possible, and then no more. You're afraid to pay a premium. Or you don't understand the power of premium in life insurance because life insurance policies are designed for a premium to be paid. And you, in my opinion, in my encouragement, you should understand what this could do for you and your family. Then number three, you tell me if I'm thinking wrong on A and I'm thinking and acting wrong on A and B, am I going to act all of a sudden correctly on C (laughs) or three? Which is, don't steal the peas. Yeah. No, you 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 show me. Don't you know? Don't tell me. You'd have to show me, right? And then number four, right? I was like, don't do business with banks outside of checking and uh, in savings account. But number five is rethink your thinking, and this is a thinking problem. The way you think is the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. All right. I mean, we're you're very technically going through. Uh, mechanically and and, and in an economic way like I'm just giving you a precursor to his book Um, so they're technical economic factual and then the thinking right and my point is and always has been that that thinking that short term thinking is not going to serve you well. It's not even going to serve the agents and advisors well that write that business because their clients will soon discover, I mean, the ones that are like, oh my gosh, this infinite bank, oh my gosh, I had no idea. You get three or four years into it and it's like, now I want to pay. You mean to tell me I'm going to be forced to reduce my premium in the future? And and then they get angry. Uh, We talk to them all day long, every day. So my point is, this is a problem in thinking. Yeah. When I go through, I had a couple of illustration reviews this week. And so we build out and then kind of go line by line with people. And you start looking at the pattern of, I'm doing another lecture series, follow up to the mechanic series on patterns of, uh, I think I'm going to call it whole life, no, whole life growth patterns. I think that's what I'm going to call it. Proved with graphics. Not proved. Su- supported yeah, proved with graphics. Yeah. 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 Right, right, right. yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to do sort of graphical analysis showing how things change in a policy over time. So hopefully I can convey this idea that in essence, there is this, it's like an avatar or like there, there's this general identifiable growth pattern and to the specifically to the cash value but to death benefit and dividends too and you know the things like the age of the insured when you start and the underwriting status and the structure and the different premium total premium outlay like those types of things can have an effect on the exact shifting and particular orientation of this curve but in general the curve has us essentially a fundamental shape right and the question kind of becomes whether you have one or not you know it's like yours is going to be marginally different you know shifted out shifted right shifted left shifted up shifted down you know some will have a greater slope some a less but if essentially it's the same curve but you, you know? so and, then therefore you would support now i won't say the word use the word prove but <clears throat> this idea of, of earlier when you want to blend is and i'm just going back to the duration is important and it depends on you the individual i'm 60 you're much younger nelson was older our we're at different points in our life expectancy Mm -hmm. right so the duration does matter therefore the structure does matter yeah so if yours looks like mine looks like yours looks like yours somebody's wrong right yeah and if there's an an entity that if there's five people at the table, okay, and we're all buyers, and all of our policies look the same, you know, there's one uh, entity that's there that was part of that, whether they actually wrote them, delivered them, talked about them, designed them, or Mark whatever. Them. You tell me who the schmuck at the table is. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying uh, the duration matters, 
and then the blend matters and you can't separate those two yeah the importance of those two all right and then uh, you also mentioned the uh the purchasing power of the dollar you mean to tell me that life insurance properly structured and i know that's broad and we can get into that as deep as you want to go can be a hedge against inflation and I can therefore yeah. counteract or mitigate the destruction of the purchasing power of my dollar. What? <laughs> and you mean to tell me you're going to brag about a four, five, or six percent rate of return on life insurance, and then out of the same breath tell me that a life insurance policy can mitigate the effects of inflation? <laughs> and I'm saying yes, it's a hard hell yes if you understand. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's pretty powerful yeah. to me. And, oh, yeah, the dollar's going to collapse. Tomorrow. You know, if they revalue the dollar, they're going to revalue everything you own because everything you own is denominated in dollars. And you have no control of that. If you happen to own life insurance and all these other assets, you're still going to win hands down. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, just the duration and the inflation and the thinking, all of that short-term thinking is in the actions – that occur mutilating the policies in my words is an outgrowth of flawed thinking yeah and that, you know it, mutilating the policies on frankenstein policies i mean we'd be pretty critical of some approaches to policy design but it really the that added uh, the attitude of that i have maybe that we have against the limited pay, short-term type thing, is only because of the trade-off that comes with it. Absolutely, right? Like yeah. the, and I, I've gotten to, because uh, I continue to talk about these and flesh them out and refine them. It, it, they get sharper. I really enjoy it. But it's like, you know, consider what the, and I know it's not fun to like consider the legal stuff, but we have to deal with it, right? It's part of the this business, right? Con, but consider, in essence, what a modified endowment contract is. Right. It's just where a whole life policy where you have too much cash value relative to death benefit too soon. According right? to the, the IRS. Yeah, yeah, the government doesn't want you to build up a bunch of value in life insurance too fast, right? They'll, they're fine with some, and but they don't like it too fast. Okay, They're going to limit it, every, the amount you can have, right? the cash value. I but mean, consider you know, too premium. much cash value too soon, right? That's the essence of what a mech is. And the way that, you know, we have this seven pay test, the way that, the IRS decided and the Senate decided to regulate this in collusion with term promoters is by, because we, you know, we went through the whole, earlier we went through the relationship between the length of payment and the pace of value generation, right? The quicker you pay for something, the faster you generate value. And so the way the IRS decided to regulate the nature of cash value growth is to say that, look, you can't pay too soon for your initial death benefit. Right, the going to pay for the TV all at once, pay you know, going to pay for the death benefit all at once, and the single pay base only contract that that becomes a modified endowment contract. The tax status of distributions regarding that policy changes; they get much worse. Right, so we have a negative tax treatment ap applied if you pay for your fixed death benefit too quickly. Right, that, that's why we have the seven pay test. My point in saying that is just to draw us back to this fundamental idea that. The modified endowment contract tax status is a, a function of the relationship between cash value and death benefit. Too much cash value too soon rel relative to death benefit is a mech. Now consider what that limited pay or 1090 type approach is. The whole goal is to get a bunch of cash value relative to death benefit very quickly. It's the same as what a mech is. The underlying principle is the same. It's like, why would you do that? Isn't this what we're trying to avoid? Because I'm right, looking so, at an internal rate of return. Right. And so all sorts of things are done. And this is why it's like, a, again, short-term oriented, like shortcut type approach. You have to have, you have to have unusual type term riders, you know, annually renewing term or blended renewing term or use the dividend to buy some 
you know, one year's worth of term, all of which we can get into, you know, these problems compound, there's layers to this. And you start introducing little issues at one level and they start to percolate up and affect other things. Um, and it all kind of goes together. Yeah. Know? But some of the, some of those things that it affects, you cannot see on that life insurance illustration. You're not going to see. It, yeah. you, there's no way. So the MEC test continues beyond the seven, the initial seven pay test. Yes. Okay. Well, how long does it continue your whole life? As long as that policy is in force, Oh, wait, I'm 25. That could be a lot of years. It could be 80 years. Okay, so let's say I have a, a policy that's designed incorrectly, in, in my opinion, your opinion, and you have, have all of these added little little adjustments, or what was your terminology? These little components. Little or these, shortcuts, yeah. Uh, the, the effects of these little things that have done, right, to, to make it look really good and for you to get to, to the yes so the agent gets paid or however that relationship goes. All right. Well, what does that do way out into the future? Let's say I want to go out, you know, 20 years, 30 years, and I want to start taking passive income. Oh, wait, now the death benefit's going to start changing. And there's a relationship between the premium, the cash value, and the death benefit in your age. Cash value and death benefit. That relationship's violated, according to the IRS, because of the MEC. So, in, in, and I know I use broad terms often, but the uh, I learned from a young man, the canvas is broad, so it's okay <laughs> to use. Okay. Do I want a policy to make when I'm 75 or 80 taking income? Yeah, no. No. Everything becomes taxable. I, I, yeah. I mean, oh. So there are no shortcuts to success. If there are, please share with me and let me know. I do not know of any. Uh, maybe when I was young. You're just not paying enough money to a business coach. It's really the problem. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you what. You talk about conversations with clients. Oh, my gosh. I love I love my clients. I love you listeners, too. But uh, it's almost therapeutic for me. Hell, half of our calls are therapeutic uh, for yeah, me. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's like, uh, so I don't feel like I need to pay someone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the billing cancels out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm telling you, with clients, I'm, I'm telling you the different situations. Um, it's thank you, I appreciate you. It's very therapeutic for me, and I trust that it's beneficial for you whenever we have conversations. Yeah. So I'm not gonna. I, I don't. I don't feel the need currently. Okay. No, and this is uh, you know this whole thing came from a conversation I had with a client earlier this week and and it was good it's very good it's a legitimate question look yep. this is i get it i get where this question comes from right the sh the shorter i mean it's pretty it's black and white you know it's a, to reason through it is the, and then you have to add to it that you know this is we're here in 2023 this was written in 2000 like you know, then you have to consider that interest rates have changed and what the effect seventy seven oh two changed to the tax code. Yeah. How the treatment of life insurance. Yeah. People read this is a broad sort of a broader point. People read becoming your own banker, and some can get the idea that the examples he uses to illustrate his points are mistaken for suggestions about how you in particular, you right now, you watching, you listening, should go and do IBC in your own life. And that's that wasn't the goal here, right? Like the these materials, the the sequence of material, the the material itself in becoming your own banker was the outcome of Nelson's two day ten hour seminar, right? And those seminars, which were, was the outcome of his career as a forester, thinking long range, a right. Christian, an economist, and a life insurance agent since nineteen sixty four. So I just say that to say that this is like this was the the outcome of an effort to present a new way of thinking in general right like what it what this means for you in particular is going to depend on you and your circumstances and then you know how far into the future we go and what is available from the industry at that time and i might have left that austrian economist what about them <clears throat> the, he was that as well in addition oh, to the absolutely Forrester. you know and two uh are you good I, yeah, I'm going to go somewhere else with it. So, yeah, I'm good for now. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, and maybe this is where you're going, but the conversation that we you referenced, we, so we had it, you know, we, we talk regularly. We had a conversation several weeks ago about the PUA, and it was pretty in depth, maybe, maybe a month or so ago. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned it now. Uh, there's, there was a lot to that. And, 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 and you know, mentioning the PUA earlier that we need the flexibility. And it's a single pay. It's akin to that. It's paid up when you pay the premium. And so you look at 
what the PUA does in the early years, say, let's, let's just say, um, it doesn't matter how old I am. Year one, I'm paying a PUA premium. And I'm going to pay the PUA premium as long as, as long as I possibly can, which therefore means I'm going to pay a base premium as long as I therefore can as well. Okay. You look at the action of the PUA compared to the base premium, the PUA premium, the cash value, the death benefit, and compare those in year one, right, from the PUA and the base whole life policy. At whatever duration that you decide and what your decision, and my encouragement would be your decision should be based on your own research, your own due diligence, and then interaction with a competent uh, advisor agent. Okay, I think that's where success is. Competent, educated, you're educated, they're educated, you know, and, and they go through the nuances and the, and the mathematics, the numbers, not even the math. Okay, you're comparing the PUA to the whole life in year one. Compare the PUA, the premium, the death benefit, the dividends, the cash value on an annual basis going forward. All right, now, talking about duration, the liquidity. If I pay a, a base whole life premium, the, the contractual guarantee from the issuing insurance company says that the cash value must equal the death benefit at age 121. Okay? So you have all that time. Now, if I pay a PUA premium, let's say I pay, uh, you know, $1,000 into PUA premium, what's the death benefit going to be? It's going to be a variation of the 1000 and it's paid up. No more future premiums. So the only thing that's going to increase that death benefit of the PUA in year one out to the duration, 121, are the dividends. Okay. Okay. So then, and I understand liquidity. I appreciate liquidity. I understand leverage. And then, so you tell me what dividend is going to be larger on the base or the PUA? I see where you're going with this. Okay. Okay. You know, now stay with me. Now, as we go out into the future and I pay a PUA 20 years from now, paying $1,000, mm -hmm. there's going to be an increase in cash value because of all of the previous premiums. There's no question, but I pay $1,000 in base premium in year 20 and I pay $1,000 in PUA premium in year 20. You tell me where the power is. Okay. <laughs> I think I understand what you're getting at. So in this I know that you can break it down economically for us. Well, let me just add how I understand this. Um, there are more than one dividend. There is more than one dividend on a whole life insurance policy built for the IBC. If you have a PUA rider, there are two. Right? There's dividends paid on PUA rider premium. There's dividends paid on base whole life premium. And the underlying fact is that dividends paid on base premium are greater than dividends paid on PUA rider premium, right? And so if you have a policy structure where relatively, a relatively larger percentage of your annual outlay goes to base premium, eventually that policy will show higher dividends, right? Um, eventually in short order. Yeah. Typically. So. Yeah. And then, so then you have <laughs> so in the future. So with, with, in other words, and that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Because dividends are a source of it PUA, is very premium, right. Yeah. Because then this is really good. Okay. So all of the ten ninety type stuff, right? It's all, we we've beaten this horse dead many times over. But the uh, the whole idea is he keeps wondering out. back in the form of dissatisfied or questioning clients or perspective. Yeah, clients. and it happens. So it's fine. We talk about it. okay. So. The idea is I'm going to pay a lot of PUA out of my own pocket to build a bunch of cash value right away, right? The, I want very little base because PUA is the, the better one, generally, is the idea, right? Okay, well, given that dividends paid on base, given that dividends also go to PUA premium, and we have structures with relatively more or less to the base, if I take a policy structure with less to base premium in order to accentuate my out-of-pocket PUA, I am simultaneously uh, inhibiting or reducing the amount of PUA I'm going to get from dividends. Right, so that's what I mean by it's counterintuitive. It's like in order to get all this PUA paid early on, I'm going to reduce the thing that's going to cause me to receive more PUA later, right? Because 
my the dividend paid on base premium will become substantial over time. And even early on, the dividend paid on base premium is greater than the dividend paid on PUA premium. It all goes back to this idea that there should be a combination, right? There should be a blend. It, it shouldn't be all one or the other, right? Because we wouldn't go to the other side of things, although you could and say that I'm just going to do base only whole life. Sure. That is um, one extreme. Yeah. And now, <clears throat> not a, by the way, not an illegitimate extreme. I mean, I've illustrated some base only. I mean, the way that after the, the section 7702 change, like the way dividends are paid on base only whole life. I mean, that, you still get respectable cash value and, the, and very long term. Very like, respectable. Just, uh, super just, respectable, right? Like if I have, so maybe it's a $20,000 total outlay, right? Was we decide what the appropriate outlay is going to be. And, um, Maybe on one on the one hand we have a forty sixty design, on the other you have a fifty. Uh, on the other hand, you have just a base only design, right? So one, the majority of that twenty grand is going to PUA. On the other hand, all of it's going to base. Well, of course, the forty sixty or some whatever the structure is that has a, a PUA allocation is going to have more cash value earlier. No question. But after the expiration of the term rider on that policy, you're going to cut that total outlay down, right? You're going to come down to the base premium. You're going to stop. You're going to pull back on PUA premium generally because PUA premium paid after the expiration of a term rider will cause a mech. You don't want that. So you're going to pull back on the PUA. But over here where you have a base only contract, first of all, you're not going to have a term rider at all. Don't need one. <coughs> Excuse me. So no, t no temporary death benefit. And then after... The other policies term rider expires, you steady continue chugging on, right? The the higher the, the policy that's base only, and just generally speaking, a policy a premium structure with more to the base, that policy is going to accept more premium over its lifetime. Right? And more premium will eventually mean more cash value. I love that because then you're you're thinking long term. And I'm I'm not making the case, I'm just supporting, you know, the statements. You're thinking long term. You're not afraid to capitalize. And if you're thinking that way in one and two, you'll probably continue correct thinking and not steal the piece. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, and, and so there is a blend. Duration and structure matter. They cannot be left out of the equation. And then I want to bring up a point on uh, Nelson Nash's state farm policy of 1959. You know, he, he that's available in his six and a half hour presentation. I believe it's shown there. And he and he puts the bar graph on there. He shows you the premium and he shows you the cash value grow and he shows you the dividend. That 1959 state farm policy, the dividends are incredible. It's it, it's shocking. You know, I'll promise you in 1959 he probably didn't believe the illustrations they didn't have illustrations like we have them today if they did he wouldn't have believed them and then he did a premium offset not really dividends to pay premium for the first 15 years in spite of that you look at that graph the dividends are staggering and the dividend comes from the base on that policy the majority yes the PUA still earns dividends yeah. but it was a all base policy the pua was only there to receive the dividend he couldn't pay additional premium to the pua he didn't have the unstructured pua so uh look that video up listen to it more than once and pay close attention to all of the points that nelson made but look at that graph and tell me the pua is a best thing going throughout the whole life policy and I, I love PUA I want to pay PUA I pay PUA I'm telling you proper blend well what does that mean duration your age your but all of those things matter yeah look in a perfect world where early look we were thinking completely long term and flexibility in the premium wasn't important and you know having cash value right away wasn't it at all important in that world all the policies would be majority just, based just traditional whole life yeah majority base yeah. yeah the the and then whatever pua you could put on there without macking without a term rider which would be very sure little. yeah yeah but I mean, that we'd be much heavier towards base, base. premium yeah. because those policies will accept that just more money over time well, I'm not going to have any cash flow when I retire. I'm, I'm not going to have any cash flow. Yeah, gotta, man, the, the, the planning for poverty mindset is so deeply ooh. ingrained 
I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket. I'm going to have lower income. I would really check those. If those thoughts like wander in, I'd show them the door, you know, um, Somebody's cooking outside, and it's very distracting. But um, that would be Jess. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, you like, now where this so where this goes is okay. <laughs> I'm tracking with a lot of that. Hey, but how about this? I'll do some of that long term stuff later, mm. and some of the short term stuff. I'll do some of the short term stuff now, right? Of course, right? This is part of this kind of whataboutism. I'll do some of the short term, some of the long term, and. Um, any way we can kind of validate or justify yeah. doing something short term oriented, oh, right? Yeah. That's what yeah. we really want. By the way, just my encouragement if, if like we're going to do, we're going to diversify, right? First of all, diversification is an ignorant strategy. <sighs> but if we're going to do that, then just follow that through, right? Like go do universal life. Like there, if you want something short term, there are other things that are going to be more short term oriented for you than sort of a curated whole life contract. Now, one of the main problems with doing whole life on the on the short term, maximum cash value as early as possible, even if we assume that the policy owner understands all the trade offs, they know that they're going to have to cut down on the premium way early. If they get all of that. One of the issues is that we've talked about is called eating up insurability. Right, you're going to put all this death benefit in force. You're going to have to put a lot of it in force, especially through term, in order to get that whole bunch of cash value in a non mac fashion right away. I love that right. that uh, Facebook group that you mentioned. I got specifically beat up for saying that. Ah, uh, what's that? Eating, you're eating up. They're eating up insurability. insurability. It's like it just screams ignorance. But yeah. anyway. So, okay. You know, so we, and this is eating up insurability is the idea that you have a maximum insurability, right? Companies will only give you so much death benefit. There are different grounds on which death benefit can be justified. There's not a lot of them. And sort of the primary one that we often fall back to is what we call human life value, right? A rough approximation of your future income, right? Your current income multiplied by some number, depending upon your age, to try to capture how many years of income your beneficiaries would lose if you died, right? That number is typically your maximum insurability. It can be other things like your net worth if that number is higher than your human life value. But in essence, there's, all, there's going to be a cap, right? You're going to have a maximum insurability at some point uh, so you can only pay, you can only get so much death benefit, you can only pay so much premium. And the question is, how much premium are you going to pay given the amount of death benefit you can ultimately get? Right? And if you do the short-term limited pay type stuff, you just get death benefit in force with a very narrow, very limited number of years to pay premium for it. Um, and what that means, that it produces this eating up insurability effect, whereby when you go to, so premium on your currently owned short-term type policies, half the you have to come down on those to retain the non mech status. When you go back to get other policies to continue paying the previously higher premium, of course, you have to go back through underwriting. So we've reintroduced underwriting risk unnecessarily. We're starting a cash value growth curve later. So we're going to have overall inferior cash value performance across the system because right? we have m more younger policies. Um, and we might, we, the underwriting risk, we might get decline but so you go back and you go back and do that and you end up with what exactly what we're talking about which is overall inferior performance yeah, and you look at the matrix you know as i age then that factor between income and total amount in force goes down of course now my income could be going up too and that can mitigate it but that is absolutely happening yeah so as i age if i have to go forward 10 years and go back through underwriting you know then if my income didn't you know, continue to go up or remain relatively level, then I can buy less Yeah, because of that factor goes smaller. I mean, when I get 65, 70, I can roughly, you know, don't hold me to it. And it's 2023 20, things change. I get it. Um, you know, I can have 10 times my income. So if I earn $100,000, I can have a million dollars in death benefit or five times mm -hmm. 500,000. You know, and then there's, of course, the net worth thing, too. But, I mean, this is, in fact, actual, real. It happened. So, now, if I'm just, you know, going to one off and buy one policy, you know, it's like, oh, this infinite banking thing is really good, and I buy a jank policy anyway. I'm not going to be happy, so I'm not going to continue, and I don't need to buy future death benefit. Which, yeah. is, And there it is, right? That's where that goes. You just stop. Yeah. Right? This is, okay, you have this nice thing, and... 
good. That was a nice decision you made sometime in the past, but you, and it's not delivering what I expected or what I actually purchased. Yeah. And you know, and you said it a minute ago. You know, look, if ninety ten looks good, Universal Life looks better. Right. Right. And then, you know, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, universal life is being heavily promoted in the language. Listen to the language that those promoters use. They say it must be properly structured universal life and the agents or advisors that speak negatively against it don't understand how to properly structure a policy. That's the language that they use. <laughs> I mean, and so, okay, uh, well, James, you've used that language before. I, I sure have, and I continue to use it. Now let's understand universal life. They talk about target premium, which is the same as a base whole life or comparable to a base whole life. There's limitations on how much excess premium you could pay. Just like with a whole life, there's a limitations on how much PUA premium you can pay. But then you look at mechanically, actually, factually, what happens to a universal life policy over time. The cost of the insurance goes up. You can't change that. Every day that you're on this earth doing a full circle, the cost of the death benefit goes up. Then you're limited on what you could do with that. Eventually, the cost of the insurance is going to eat up that account value. So you're going to have to increase your premium and or reduce your death benefit. And I assure you the life insurance companies limit your ability to do that. I don't care what they say. Yeah. It's in the contract. So but I, I do want to get there because Universal Life is on page 39, so conveniently right next to this. Oh, I didn't like, really want to this, talk about it. But. All of this goes together <laughs> really nicely. Yeah. The, towards the end of 38, Nelson writes, in describing this design of a policy, some people have called the process of putting a paid-up additions rider on an ordinary life policy, quote-unquote, overfunding the policy oh, we had that conversation maybe that can help <laughs> in the overall understanding but the objective should be simply to get as much money as possible into a policy with the least amount of insurance instead of trying to put as little money in and provide the greatest amount of insurance initially okay so a couple of things there people online have taken this word overfunding and just abused it Right? And it's very popular. I want to overfund. You know, and it refers to a lot of different things. What I want to say here is that when Nelson alludes to this language, he says, maybe that can help in the overall understanding, but the objective should be something different. Right. So that that language of, oh, you can't over. The overfunding in the book here is in quotation marks. Okay. You can't you can't over you can't exceed a limit, right? That all of this is done by contract, right? We're applying for the right to pay certain payments, certain premiums up to specified limits with a life insurance company. That life insurance company is going to consider that ap application and most likely offer a policy to conform to it. That policy states what certain limits are, and. Those are contractually set. There's no going over them, right? So to can you overfund a whole life policy in the sense that you can add a PUA rider to pay premium over and above base premium? Sure, you can do that. But what overfunding has become online is pay a wild amount of PUA premium in the first year, right? Maybe a $100,000 total outlay or whatever with you know an ongoing outlay of five or 10,000. Right, so big, large lump sum year one, little itty bitty dribble thereafter, and that's been called overfunding, right? And that's or supposed to be a dump in, oh or a God. dump in, oh, yeah. Gosh. Supposed to be the next great evolution of the short term limited pay type thinking. Again, all around maximum cash value as soon as possible. None of this escapes the problems we're talking about. Right? You know, we we talked about this, and you know, before the before the cameras turned on. Nelson didn't use, to my knowledge, I was around him as much as I possibly could be, and I'm not speaking for him, my experience. Nelson did not use that terminology overfunding. In my opinion, that's exactly why it's in quotes. Overfunding, that language comes from the, the, the sales process of universal life. Okay? So 
they use it. I mean, it's used across the industry now. I get it. Nelson didn't, in my experience, use that language, and I believe that's why it is it is in quotations, you know. But he clarifies exactly his point, just as as Ryan just demonstrated. This idea of overfunding is, you know, I can't explain it better than you just did. My point is, Nelson didn't use that language. And he put it in quotation marks, I believe, on purpose. That language came from the sales process of universal life. Just like when you hear somebody say, oh, this is investment grade life insurance. That is universal life insurance lingo back in the day from selling universal life. Anything to make whatever it is look better than it is. Oh, I'm overfunding this. So <laughs> over, it's really good. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand, James. This is investment grade life insurance. Oh. Oh, okay. So the implication is that it's better than it would be if you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. The ordinary way. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very interesting that you say that that the uh, overfunding maybe may have been an allusion to the sales language of universal life. I mean, that kind of lines up because the literally the next section <laughs> is on universal life. Like this kind, there's a underlying flow? structure and flow here. A path. Yeah. Oh yeah. And this yeah. is I, I love to point this out because it's not enough because the the annually renewing term and the blended term PUA riders are so popular out in the industry. And I love this. There's a longer section in building your warehouse of wealth on this, but here it is too in, in becoming your own banker, right? Nelson's talking about when he looked at universal life, he says, this happened during a time of high interest rates and universal life, quote unquote, looked good in the early years of the policy. When I first saw the policy, universal life, I ran some illustrations and these policies kept, quote unquote, falling apart. When the insured attained age of 65 to 70. What? And here we go. The cost of one year term became prohibitive at the advanced ages and, quote, ate up the cash fund, end quote, from that point forward. Therefore, I never sold one of them when I was in the business, and I surely wouldn't buy one. That line... The cost of one year term became prohibitive. That is like the golden line right here when we talk about these other types of term writers, right? Annually renewing term, blended term, PUA. Both of those use annually renewing term, one year term. It's the same underlying death benefit pricing mechanism that is the structure and you yeah. can't un he goes on you can't unbundle universal life or whole life is what they tried to do with universal life you cannot unbundle them yeah and and so i've said it many times you know if you have a farmer has a calf with two heads all right it, it's flawed it's flawed you might know? not live as long <laughs> what do you what do you what so what should the farmer do you should put it out of his misery as soon as possible. Hmm. Move on to better, greener you know, pastures. I want to make another. <laughs> I want to make another comment, but I also want to go back to both before we end here. The next uh, paragraph. Next came executive life out of California. Okay. Now <clears throat> it makes me like. Sometimes I should feel like I'm an old guy, but I don't. 1980, Executive Life out of California, A-plus rated company, big company. Yeah, and they go into receivership. All right, so a life insurance company can't go bankrupt. They're regulated by states. So the state of California went in there and took them into receivership. And there's only two, one of two outcomes. You either liquidate the company or you rehabilitate the company back to health, right? Uh, well, that company got liquidated, and so every other legal reserve life insurance company doing business in the state of California had to guarantee, right, through the Guarantee Association Fund, all of those policyholders. This is, a, this is important, uh, in my opinion. So the primary guarantee of all life insurance is the claims paying ability by the issuing company. If they go out of business through the process of receivership, liquidation, or rehabilitation, every other life insurance company doing business in that state, and they all do business in California, most of them. 
There's a secondary guarantee through the guarantee associations of each state. Yes, it's limited. And I'm and I've said it before, I believe. Last year, this is 2023. Some uh, companies that I am intimately familiar with made their last payment to make executive life policyholders whole last year in 2022. How many years later? Yeah, I should be better at math. 1980. This is 2023. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of liability that executive life uh, took on and then and then mismanaged because of universal life. And he goes on to talk about Michael Milken, you know, the junk bond king. And as a there's another commentary, you know, as Michael Milken became after he got out of prison, he became a consultant to the federal government on how to mm-hmm. how to find or track or, you know, uh, the shenanigans within different investment companies. Yeah. He continues he continues on the next page. It says, lastly, there came variable life invented by Equitable Life Assurance Society. It was nothing more than one year term insurance with a side fund of a mutual fund. Notice the diff- the similarity, right? The objection on to universal life and to variable life has fundamentally the same basis. Right. Absolutely. The underlying death benefit pricing mechanism is annually renewing. Right. And so when the, my my view, frankly, is that the use of annually renewing term in whatever form it is, just a standalone annually renewing term writer, a blended term PUA writer, a dividend election at the company, the use of annually renewing term in the context of whole life is just a mechanism of trying to sneak in universal life into the whole life space. Right? And it's the, the annually renewing term is done to artificially accentuate early growth, early cash value growth, which is what the purpose of universal and variable life is to show great on paper growth using some arbitrary selected interest rate. Uh, and it's the, so it's the same functional purpose of one year term in the UL and VL world applies in the whole life world. It's to facilitate the artificial inflation of cash value growth earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then the side fund is the only thing that's changed. High interest rates with right. EF Hutton. A particular mechanism. Interest rates come down. Oh, my gosh, what do we got to do from the life insurance company's perspective? We want to, we've forgotten our heritage. We want to be all things to all people. We want to be a financial services institution. Hey, we'll wrap up sub accounts, mutual funds. Wrap it up in a life and because look at the market. It's going like gangbusters. And it'll overcome, right, the returns of the market, the sub accounts in the VUL, VUL, variable universal life, are going to overcome the rising cost of insurance internally. And the client will never see it until it blows up later. Oh, yeah, well, how'd that go? Okay, no, they've about all blown up. If they have them now, I mean, if you still want, I, I don't want to speak. Uh, <laughs> if they haven't blown up, which most of them have, they're going to blow up in the future, my opinion. Oh, wait. Then the life insurance company comes out. Well, wait. Hold on. We have equity indexed universal life equity. So, oh, there's some grain there. But we don't want it. It's not a security. So, we want to be able to ride it in the life insurance industry without being an investment company or investment advisor. <laughs> and we can use historical, hypothetical projections on what an index has produced in the past right and then we'll project that out forward right because the market's still going like gangbusters but now you don't have to participate in any losses zero's your hero all that kind of marketing terminology right the internal cost of the insurance is going up but james we have 110 and 120 150 percent cap on what could be earned in the index Oh, okay. Well, who has a right to move those up and down Mm. by contract? And who routinely moves them up and down? The life insurance company. All right. So, strike one, they got it out. I mean, they got out. They lost it. They missed it. Strike one, universal life. Strike two, variable universal life. And you tell me you're going to hit a home run with index universal life? (laughs) Nay, I say strike three, brother. You're going to be out. But look, I've said it many times. I know I'm very repetitive. W.C. Fields, look him up, black and white. I know I'm, a, I'm, you know, you're more than likely younger than me. W.C. Fields, look, 
the broker made money, the firm made money, so the agent made money, the life insurance company made money, talking about universal life, and two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> yeah. The client. Yeah, every, it, it seems like there's pure <laughs> base only whole life, you know, and then there are all these attempts to dilute it or water it down or really to ultimately fundamentally evolve it into something like term, which is some nothing ever pays oh and it's just something that the insurance company What a deal. On. If I'm going to buy decreasing one year term, which is a blended PUA, it's either through a, the blending of the PUA and the death benefit through one year term riders. It's either the death benefit is going to go down. It's supposed to be in relationship to the increase in death benefit from the dividend option going to the PUA, or you're going to buy, you know, a, a, a term product for a time period. And then it's just going to, it's all going to come off eventually illustratively. Right <laughs> now you tell me in, in a perfect world, there's never a problem, Right. So you're gonna, I'm the life insurance company, and you're gonna pay me a premium. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the level premium and very affordable for you, okay? So you can Thank go you. invest and do all the uh, things that Wall, Wall Street wants you to do. Yeah, 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 crypto tokens, yeah. And the longer you live, the closer to graduation you become. Period. And the future is unknown, and we got statistical. I, I get all that. So you're going to pay me a premium, and I am going to eliminate as soon as I can my risk to pay you a death benefit? <laughs> well, perfect. <laughs> uh, same with long data term. Why can't I buy a 60-year term policy? Mm. Because then, by God, the life insurance company had to pay a death benefit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are mechanisms to manage liability. It's the company managing their liability. Um, now, whether that means the contract is favorable for your own purposes with respect to IBC, probably another question. But yeah, you know, you go back to both. You know, maybe you should do both. Maybe you should do a ninety ten or this short dated theory, the long dated theory, and then you talked about insurability. <clears throat> um, over and over and over, you know, we have conversations with people who have bought into the idea of short duration premium, mm. whether it's a 90, 10, 80, 20, whatever the construct is, right? And then, um, of course, if you're extremely happy, probably, you know, you don't reach out to uh, someone. But invariably, I don't know how many conversations, I mean, a, a ton of conversations where somebody actually did become an insurable. What? Mm. What? You've got a the scrawny little death benefit. You're limited on how much you can pay. You're limited in the duration that you can pay. The dividend's been, being eaten up by the term rider. It's not even increasing the death benefit. Yeah. You know, and then when the term rider goes, you're going to have a scrawny little death benefit. I mean, it, there's no... There's no financial planning. There's no personal planning. There's no, there's no serious consideration and implementation in those situations. It's somebody selling a life insurance policy, yeah. my opinion. And I would go further and say, too, that the marginally greater early cash value that you get in one of these limited pay anti-base premium type things is really quite marginal. <laughs> relative to the uh, um, what you need to do in order to have a long-term premium payment. No, there's no question. And that's what those graphs I thought showed well. It's like you're bickering about marginal, relatively marginal changes here early on and completely neglecting the significant differences that will come later in order to appear competitive appear most competitive mm -hmm. to yeah. the customer who doesn't know that your implicit goal is to maximize cash value as early as possible yeah that's really what that is it, it is i mean I, i've talked about it you've done it graphically previously uh, many times it, it's like the difference is is typically uh a tenth or tenths of a basis point the difference right in a rate of return Let's say it's 1%, right? Well, you've really mutilated a policy to make that happen. But then it it just dispels the idea of volume. You can't eliminate the rate versus volume consideration. You can't. 
with dividend, I mean, with duration and structure. Man, if I pay a premium 20 years from now uh, and, and it's 15 times increase in cash value, that, but I paid a, a anti, you know, skinny base. I bought into the anti base idea. So I might be able to pay a thousand dollars in base premium and it might go up 15 times, 15,000. Whoa. <laughs> well, yeah, you can. Yeah. The volume. Okay. Right. Versus volume. But now if I can pay a $100,000 base because I was not anti base and now there's a million five increase. What? Or yeah. let's say a million three. I don't care. I don't want to make it look better than it is. So, yeah, you'd be happy, man. You throw that $1,000 in every year and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the power of the base. I'm going to start doing more um, just looking, you know, at the different different levels, the different cases. Like, let's just take a glimpse of what just base only would look like. You know, you know the old. Why isn't the Why isn't the question that? I'll, I'll you know do a bit of a, a you know do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, do a little bit of you know 40, 60, 50, 50, 30, 70, and some base only. Yeah. Right. But no, I want to do a little bit of the short term stuff. You know, just yeah, yeah, yeah. It, my it, fix in. Like, oh my gosh! It's, it's, and then and I, you know you see the the illustrations. This is what it looks like at ninety ten. This looks like eighty twenty. This is what it looks like seventy thirty. This blah 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 blah. And you're you're playing games with numbers on a page. Yeah, and that that idea that you know we've been critical of illustrations before, but. They're all based on the current experience of the company. You know, people get this idea with modified endowment contracts. It's like it's either a mech or it's not. And that's kind of the end of it. Yeah. It's like that's not the – it is not that clean cut. <clears throat> the mech limit, the amount of premium that if paid would cause a mech, changes year to year, changes based on your premium. It changes based on the amount of PUA coming from dividends. It, all that's going to change. And it mainly changes based on the policyholder's action. Right. Yeah. No, but yeah, so you tie that in with the flawed thinking earlier. Yeah, the probability goes through the roof on a future met. Period. Yeah, and, you, and then you introduce actual practical things that actually happen to people. You know, where suddenly it's not all perfect. I've had a couple this week. Things aren't going according to plan. Need to make an adjustment to how much in premium we're paying. Um, the, the policies that these people have are structured to allow them to do that. You know, but as you start to get as you start to chip away at that foundation, get the base premium as low as possible, get the initial death benefit as low as possible, the whole structure becomes more and more fragile, more and more susceptible to little changes that might come along. So maybe one time you don't get the full PUA paid that you intended to pay. And so the amount of death benefit that the system thought you were going to buy that year is not how much you actually bought. And so now we need more in term death benefit. And that's going to come from the one-year term rider. And originally, the amount of death benefit on the term rider was supposed to go down every year because we had this predicted, neatly assumed path for your future payments. And here you are suddenly screwing that up. So now the dividends, <laughs> yeah. so now the dividends are going are now lower, right? You didn't pay as much premium as you thought, so the amount of the dividend that's going to be paid to your policy is going to be lower than it was. So we're not going to get as much permanent death benefit from the dividend that we thought we were. So now we need more in this temporary term death benefit. Oh, and you're a year older. And so now it's going to cost more per premium dollar. So you need to pay up. Surprise, you're going to get a letter. Maybe you get it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you ignore it because it's 2023. I get it. Uh, so you don't pay it. Right. And, and, but maybe you do. Maybe well, you half the time year. you can't even pay it. Some not there. Sometimes you don't even have the right to pay. That. You just don't even have the option. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you do. But if you don't, if you have the option, you know, my encouragement is to pay it. Uh, but if you don't pay it, where does that cost come? Where does that premium come Yeah, so either you, pay, either you pay the higher surprise tax compliance cost, which came because something happened this year. And by the way, everything on that illustration, right, is occurs in a compounded environment. So if you miss premium one year, the full amount, you don't exactly stick to plan one year. Well, now all future values are going to vary from what was originally illustrated. So this is going to happen again, right? There's going to be another form where you're going to be another year later, you get another letter saying, oh, we need more money for the term. And by the way, you control none of that, right? The company is deciding all of that. And so they'll decide how much more you need to pay in order to pay for your one year's worth of 
temporary death benefit, which you probably won't use, probably going to outlive, but whatever. You got to pay it to keep the policy from being a mech, right? So you rock in a hard place. Either pay up for additional temporary death benefit and maybe do that again and maybe several times for the, over the life of this contract or lose mech status. Yeah, or, or, or you could potentially lose the, you do it enough and you could lose the ability even to pay a PUA And that's really where it and goes. And then it's permanent. Right. And that's where that goes, right? Eventually, you just stop like, oh my God, like enough is enough. We'll just minimize exposure, minimize how much gets paid to that thing so that it can just chug along and be fine. And that's fine. That's good. Right? I mean, it's, you know, it's not, it could be worse, but certainly not going to perform as the way, in the way that it could have, right? Had things been done with a more long-term orientation. Oh, I happen to have an outstanding loan on that policy too. If I don't want to pay a premium, I sure as heck don't want to pay a loan repayment. And then let's add, is it a direct recognition company? Because that doesn't even matter. Now the loan activity about? means even lower <laughs> dividends, right? You see yeah. how this starts to all pile on together, mm. right? So, and every little, every one, every layer is just the policy owner ceding control back to the company yep. because we have a fundamental uh, re refusal, fundamental resistance to, to capitalizing, to enduring the early illiquidity, right? And so we seed control back to the company control over the pricing of the death benefit control over the determination of the magnitude of the dividend control over how much in uh, out-of-pocket premium i can pay in a given year all that just giving it right back right we don't have a we, we don't give over control of financial things enough in life so why not do it more here in whole life right just give that control advocate that responsibility as quickly as possible and all for the benefit of getting to see the higher number earlier and that's what that is. But, you know, it's like, is that advisable? Is that wise long-term? Yeah. You know, if you're going to compare, <clears throat> I mean, that was beautiful. Thank you for articulating that. Um, I'm sure everybody who owns a 9010, their advisor kind of walked them through those kinds of things and the <laughs> things that we've talked about and the bolster their, you know, fortitude to pay big premium than, you know, these skinny base policies. But if you're going to compare, you know, 9010 or these really thinly uh, structured policies, go ahead and compare them with universal life. And, and then while you're comparing all that, go ahead and compare, you know, the longest dated, cheapest uh, term policy that you can buy with, in, uh, in uh, tax free government bonds. I mean, just if you're going to compare, compare. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Hmm. None, of of that, none of that none of that none of that none of that not a single comparison that i just encouraged you if you want to compare uh included the banking function or <laughs> you <laughs> controlling the banking function and what that could even mean for you and your family. And here it is Christmas. We hadn't even talked about gifts. Let me say that, you know, freedom is a gift. It's not, uh, it's given by birthright in my opinion, but typically it's quickly lost. So therefore it must be recovered and then maintained. Um, but you can't have freedom in my opinion without financial freedom and you can't fully enjoy uh, or experience financial freedom unless you control the banking function. And the banking function at the you and me level, in my humble opinion, is best controlled when you implement the infinite banking concept and you understand the infinite banking concept, your contractual rights and just the mechanisms and how to do it. None of it is complicated. Um since it is Christmas, I didn't want to leave that out. And the, one of the best gifts you can give yourself, right, is financial freedom. The One of the best gifts you can give your future prodigy is financial freedom. And you can't give anything that you don't have. So my encouragement is to give it. All right. And then while we're talking about truth, I think all of that was truth. You know, I just got to say that Jesus Christ wasn't born on July or December 25th. <laughs> Can't help it. You know, he was conceived on December 25th, and it's well documented. Go to Luke chapter 1, I believe, uh, Luke 1, chapter 3. And I don't mean to be preachy. It's Christmas. We're <laughs> celebrating typically the, the birth of Christ. He was not born on December 25th. Prove me wrong. I couldn't help it. <laughs>
You snuck it in. Well, I'm glad we covered this part. I know people have questions about it. I get a lot of questions about it, so I'm sure there's a lot more questions that I don't get about it, but that are real, still out there. And I hope that's helpful. That was a lot. I enjoyed it. Thanks for, uh, you know, squeezing off time to come down here before you travel the world and celebrate Christmas with your family. My pleasure. Merry Christmas. Y'all have a fun Christmas. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.